Okay, uh, hello, my name is Matthew. Uh, you can call me Matthew. Uh, before anything other than telling you my name is Matthew, I'd like to define what I will be speaking about and what I won't be speaking about. This is not a talk about the technical process of migration from a fairly large scale Drupal 6 to Drupal 8 site, at least not from me. Uh, my group and I support the back end of the site, but I did not do the heavy lifting on the migration. I'm a Drupal developer, but in this instance, I was the go-between, the liaison, the other foreign term to encapsulate this sort of responsibility between the front end stakeholders of the website and the developers hired to do so, to do the heavy lifting. Uh, and while I have a perspective on that heavy lifting, it is mostly admiring from a little ways away. So then other than telling you my name, which again is Matthew, uh, what will I be discussing? My plan is to discuss the two positive decisions that led to a mostly successful migration effort and the two elements that negatively impacted the effort despite efforts, attempts at mitigation. Uh, but before I do any of that, I should probably go over again um, the site in question, UFT.org. The UFT.org is the website for the United Federation of Teachers, a union of, as I mentioned, over 200,000 members, mostly representing teachers, hence the name, um, in the New York City, just city, public school system. But we also represent other school-related professionals, family child care providers, teachers in a number of private and charter schools, and registered nurses. And on top of that, we have about 64,000 retired members. So the website provides information about members' rights and responsibilities, their benefits and activities, their efforts and their opportunities. And in these deeply unsettled times, it has been a major resource in helping to keep our members and the children that they take care of healthy. When I came to work for the UFT a few years ago, the website was being served off of Pressflow, which is a Drupal 6 fork that was officially past its end of life. <coughs> Our version had been cobbled together with a large number of deeply specific custom modules and patches put together on the fly. Uh, content was being done with hard-coded URLs and inline styles. SEO was kludgy and problematic. For all of these and some other reasons, the decision was made to move to straight up Drupal 8. And here is where the first positive arose. We aimed big. A number of stakeholders initially suggested doing a quick six to eight migration, laying a reworked version of the design on top, which I'll give you a look at. Hold on just a second, let me serve that up. While he's pulling that up, I just wanna say that um, we represent um, titles such as social workers, guidance counselors, um, occupational therapists, vision and hearing, which makes um, the site a little more complex because you have to serve all of those different kinds of members and they have different um, contractual standards and different you know, requirements. So you're actually serving an audience, you know, differing, differing audiences. Okay, Matthew, got the site up. Yes. Um my group and I pushed back on this. Uh, we saw this as a unique opportunity to do a systemic review of the site and its needs and to put together a new version of the site with and following best practices, a version that would quickly and efficiently allow properly styled input and would effectively service the key stakeholders and the end users. And as Robin mentioned, that's an incredibly broad swath of end users. Prevailing in this argument led to a long necessary focusing on and of the site. The previous version, which you're looking at a screenshot of over here, treated all parts as equals. Workshops as part of the redevelopment effort led to a prioritization of the key, truly key elements. UI review led to both a more stylishly attractive site and to the interface doing a lot of heavy lifting effectively. Oh, and for those keeping track, that's three heavy liftings so far. Uh, my plan is to do 11 in total. I just haven't figured out how yet. Uh, workflow review led to a dramatically increased ease of input and ensured input consistency. Robin, would you agree? 
Yes. Good. All of this flowed from the decision to go big, and all of this led to a much more effective communicative style. Actually, I'm going to stop the sharing. Let's see if I can figure out how to. Yeah, OK. Um, the second decision was equally important. Set realistic deadlines. For a union that is primarily centered on teachers, again, hence the name, uh, the beginning of the school year is a fairly important date in our calendars. And the draw to get the new website out in time for the new school year is powerful, powerful draw. The problem here is that after extensive internal discussions and a range of external interviews with various firms, we didn't choose a vendor and begin work on the process of migration until sometime in March. For those not up on the New York City school schedule, the school year begins at the beginning of September, normally right after Labor Day. Would it have been possible to design the new interface, migrate all the content, create all necessary functionality, work out all the bugs, and have it ready for a new school year? Yes, in much the same way is it possible for a suddenly sentient colony of ants to commandeer an aircraft carrier <laughs> and terrorize the world, as per my new screenplay, viewable upon request. Uh, one of the, uh, fortunately, there were enough people, sorry, I suddenly lost track. As the, um, one of the reasons the custom kludgy nature of the previous iteration of the site was because of the devotion to the same deadline at that time. As the deadline loomed, it led the developers at the time to employ shortcuts built on shortcuts built on shortcuts to finish in time. Fortunately, there were enough people around who had gone through the past effort that there was a consensus on letting the process play out. There was a deadline, uh, but it was grounded and reasonable, informed by the level of effort. When we did launch, it was on our schedule, and it was with comfort and assuredness rather than desperation and panic. Uh, except, of course, for me, of course, but that's just me, you know, desperate, panicked. So what were the two things that interfered despite efforts at mitigation? Well, the first was quite foreseeable, but was never fully resolvable. Primary stakeholders in this project were also primary stakeholders in other important projects, and getting the attention and feedback needed was a major challenge. As much as was allowable, we used delegation and tried to concentrate the points where feedback and direction were needed to etched in stone reserve times. This helped, but the second thing that hurt was also easily foreseeable and is literally as old as time, project creep. As project manager Archangel Michael will tell you, Earth was initially supposed to have 11 plants, four beetles and two mammals, humans and cats, because cats can't open the, the cans themselves. Things creep. As people realized that things were that were not possible before were potentially possible now, they began reimagining things they yearned for. They began to dream the impossible dream. Here is where talented project managers and finite budgets come strongly into play. Would the site actually function on time versus would it be really, really cool if we do this? Was there project creep? Well, uh, sun still rises in the east, sets in the west. So yes, of course, there was project creep. But it was more than we wanted, but significantly less than was possible. Ultimately, the site launched at the time we wanted with all of the major elements necessary for successful, for successful functioning. As an aside, an enormous amount of the credit for that uh, was based on the firm we hired, Four Kitchens. They did the heavy lifting. Uh, kept things moving forward and gave us something we're happier than not with. Wacky aside, though they weren't involved with our original website creation and design, Four Kitchens were the actual originators of the press flow Drupal 4. It is, in fact, a small world after all. And that is my discussion. That was great, Matthew, and very entertaining. Um, Robin, thanks for uh, chirping in. Uh, do you want to um, identify yourself, Robin? And uh, since you do have some insight into this project, uh, um, Matthew is our back-end Drupal developer and man about town. 
Uh, <laughs> and Robin, I forgot what your official title is. Sorry. Well, it changes depending changes on what I'm working from day on. to day. It does. <laughs> hour to hour. In this project, uh, the first half of the project, I was sort of the um, project manager for the content side because we have two divisions in the way our organization is structured. So my team did a lot of the day to day decisions, you know, prior to the build time. And then once we started building, I kind of shifted to project owner. So we, uh, a large part of the success, and I think Matthew gave a little too much credit for Four Kitchens, was that we were really deeply involved in this project. I mean, we were in the trenches with Four Kitchens. They were doing the building, but it was a full-time job for me during that time. I, I, I never meant to imply that uh, the success was not also heavily, heavily held by you. And I'm sorry if I gave that impression. And everyone, please <laughs> turn away for a second and then turn back and have your minds wiped. What I meant was that, you know, a project can be like a firm doing all the work or you can, or hardly any of the work. This was really in concert. We were really a well-oiled machine and like a lot of UFT and UFTWF were like involved with this and it was a full-time job for all oh, of us. By the way, the distinction that Robin is making there is between the United Federation of Teachers and the United T Federation of Teachers Welfare Fund. They are two separate entities intrinsically though obviously they work in concert. The welfare fund is uh, in care of benefits and other things of that nature, and the, the union is the federation. Um, and because we chose an agile design, to, to piggyback on what Matthew said, um, that's where the project's creep came into um, to fruition because we did a full discovery. And during the full discovery, there was all these ideas that, oh, what we could do. Since the original intent of the original contract, the original budget was for just the migration, suddenly we were doing a full redesign. Yeah, and Robin, you can bring up how, how many um, uh, content types we had, which we had to whittle down because we realized from our initial Drupal install of Drupal 6, or as Matthew said, a fork of Drupal 6, Pressflow, we learned a lot about what was really useful in our environment and our content. I mean, we have um, many, many different content types and we wanted to make the SEO uh, a lot more efficient. So we spent a lot of time uh, whittling down the number of content types. Well, we still have a lot, but I think we had around 30 before. And I thought it was a little bit more than that, but uh, it was definitely, and one of the things that we definitely, just to expand on what Matthew's overview of our migration process, we wanted to make sure that it was a collaborative effort. And uh, the digital communications team, which Robin is a member of, and her colleagues, and the IS web team, which Matthew and I are part of, and Four Kitchens worked on all this collaboratively because we wanted to have knowledge and control of how everything was working. And we still do work pretty closely with uh, Four Kitchens, but at a, a nominal level at this point. Um, so we wanted to make sure that it was collaborative so that we could continue to be part of the process. Um, I'm not privy to what Matthew is intending to say in the future um, of this presentation, but I want to say a big part of the migration process was paring down our taxonomy. Um, over the 10 years or so that we had Drupal 6, our taxonomy terms had grown like su substantially. And we had to change our mindset instead of thinking of things as in buckets in a print format, which is very much how my department thinks because they are print people. Um, we had to think of like, well, how would a user be looking for this content? You know, and not think of it as in terms of a holistic newspaper where it's like in this section, but more about the subject matter and how to group it differently. So a great deal of the migration was remapping taxonomy from one area to another. And it was a very complicated, the taxonomy is, continues to be 
complicated, but it was just a little less complicated than it was before. Uh, I, I will say all of that is true. I just didn't fit into the context of my particular speech, so that's why I didn't bring up that side of it. I uh, assumed if that was going to be brought up, it'd be, be better to be brought up by somebody from your group rather than myself. Okay. So there's a question uh, in terms of what's on our roadmap. Um, I don't know, Robin, if you or, or Matthew want to speak to that. I know, um, you know, one of the things that we're working on closely, I don't know if anybody out there uses the K4 module to publish content from print to uh, Drupal automatically. Uh, and that's really in our sites right now. And, and Robin's team and Matthew have been working closely with um, Vajun on getting the K4 module to work. And what that does is, you know, you can output an XML file from uh, InDesign and ingest it into Drupal, but you have to make sure that the uh, content types and uh, metadata comes in as you want it to. Is that correct, Robin? Correct. I'm just counting the content types. One, two. I think it's 22. But a lot of them are not in use. They were from the migration. And so I think some of them are going to be eliminated. Um, we are still sort of like at the back end of building the site because we launched a minimally viable site about a year ago. But, you know, the pandemic has kind of distracted our um, resources along with other um, major technology projects so that we haven't given the website as much focus as we should. Um, so some of those content types are going to disappear because we're not using them. Um, we also streamlined our workflow. When we first uh, started with Drupal 6, we had, you know, some very lofty ideas of how we thought we wanted the workflow to look. And after using it for almost nine years, we said, wow, you know, maybe we should go back to uh, the original intent and scale that back. And that also made our, our publishing and maintenance uh, a, a little bit smoother, I think. I want to also answer the roadmap question. Um, so the newspaper, which is a major part of our content that we send out to members, and it's more and more digital every year because our members that are, even the retirees, they're all digitally savvy now. Um, that wasn't built because we had a minimally viable website. We only just got that online a couple, like a month ago or so. So I know in that roadmap, I know Chris is building out like the archive for that. And that's very complicated because that employs a lot of the complicated taxonomy that we use. Um, so we are not planning on building microsites. Um, we have other integrations with other technology things like we're working heavily in Salesforce now. And so a lot of the resources are focused in that direction and moving over our email platforms to, um, to marketing cloud and some integrations with for events and things. So a lot of it is not Drupal focused right now. And, you know, we only have a few, it's actually a small organization considering how much the volume of our output. So, you know, when one project, you know, starts to become a big, you know, lift, then we, all of our resources shift in that direction. Um, code based and hosting, um, where the code base is in um, GitHub and we're hosting it on Pantheon. And I, I guess either Lenny or, or Matthew can continue. No, oh, I mean, that's accurate. We, we early on, you know, or for the last nine years before we did this new release, we hosted our own environment. Um, but, you know, it costs a certain amount of resources to run those Linux servers and keep them highly available. And Pantheon seemed like a good option at the time. Uh, though we're trying to, you know, upgrade our, our solar engine to get a tighter search. Um, but that was the route that we decided to go in terms of hosting. For a number of reasons. One, when Hurricane Sandy happened, we lost electricity in the building and so our website went down. And uh, another time when a contract came out and it was a very um, controversial one with the city, 
the web server crashed because we got like a, a lot more hits, like 10 times more usual hits and we couldn't handle it. So for the, some of those other reasons were why we wanted to do cloud-based um, hosting. Anything else, Matthew? Uh, uh, you were gonna show the new website. I did. Oh, he had it up can for you, a bit. Yeah, I had it up. Can you put it up? Because like some of the changes we made, I can like Hold talk up. about that a little bit. Let me share it again. Uh, so one of the things we did is we wanted to make the homepage less um, busy and overwhelming because we, you know, after, so the union is very political. We deal with city contracts, you know, we're dealing with children, we're dealing with the city and their employees. The teachers are essentially city employees. So we had a landmark case happen in a few years ago called Janus where union members were no longer required to play union, pay union dues. Now the services we offer our members are extensive and it costs money. And if they no longer pay for those services, we can no longer serve them to the best of our ability. So we wanted to highlight the things that we do for them. And so one of the things we did is we divided the navigation up to, you know, to their rights and their benefits and, you know, about us and what we're doing and how to contact them. The, then we have a secondary navigation go up, Matthew, on top, which is, you know, it's, it's the same act, like all of this navigation is the same, it's just split up in a different way so that we could really target it for them. Um, when we were talking about the different constituencies, that's like covered under chapters. We have something like 40 chapters or more on this website divided into different groupings we have their contracts online. Um, so it's, you know, this site, it looks very simple, but it's it's quite extensive. Um, Matthew, do you feel like, um, since I didn't prepare to talk at all, do you feel like giving them a little bit of overview of the homepage? I, okay. Uh, as I mentioned, and as Robin brought up again, there was the focusing uh, of the site so that the the most important elements that people were looking for, their rights, the benefits, the union itself would be here. Um, if you, I can actually, hold on, let me share the old uh, version again and I'll show that before it was A, constrained and B, extremely busy, uh, text very small, uh, the elements were all displayed in equal in equal levels. Um, it, it, it was just um, not an effective way of conveying the information desired. Uh, here, easy access to the things most people care about. Uh, here, especially considering the times, <coughs> the coronavirus info hub elements of what's new, union rights and benefits, union proud. Uh, these are members who are expressing how the union has benefited them. Call. Um, chapters, this is, I'm answering a question. Chapters in theory could manage their own content, but um, we control it because we feel like we can um, tweak the, the, um, the copy a little better than the chapters. A lot of the chapters um, are so busy being in the field, they don't really have the time to, to craft a good message. But uh, actually bringing up the chapters is a very good point because those pages we have created in a way that's almost fully automated. Uh, why don't you pull up like uh, maybe psychologist or something? Uh, DOE chapters hmm? under DOE. Under, it's under DOE chapters. Okay. So school psychologist. Am I missing it? Uh, it's on the, oh, it's so social workers oh, and psychologists because they're. 
So the only thing here that is up needs to be updated on a regular is their letter to their um, members. So, you know, we, we work with them, our team works with them and they put it up. The rest of this is all automated. Like they're the news like feed and the photo gallery. Um, the, you know, and everything on the page just comes in basically based on how we tag to use the tech, like tag the taxonomy. It, you know, it just brings it in, which makes the, I guess it is a microsite, like you're saying, it does make it a lot easier to maintain content on these sections. Cause yeah, they even refer to their section as my website. So that's a good question. Sorry, Matthew. No problem. Okay. Um, you wanna talk about paragraphs because that's a really big component of, of the flexibility of the design. I think you as an actual user would be better suited to discuss it. Okay, well, go back to the uh, home, any page, a home page or any of the landing pages that have paragraphs. Um, home page has paragraphs. That. Okay, so okay. I, I don't know how many people just on this call uses paragraphs in Drupal 8 or what paragraphs are. Um, it's a silly name to call it paragraphs, but they're essentially, they're, they're function a lot like blocks, but they're, you know, they're elements, they're widgets that have a complete, like a certain function. A paragraph could be text. It could be an image with text side by side. It could be a photo gallery. It could be an image. So we have numerous defined paragraphs that allow certain page types to you know, mix and match content so that we can create these designs. So like this first one is a hero image followed by text, followed by, he's moving fast. I'm trying um, to, what you're discussing. Yeah, so um, like that second element on the page is a image plus a, like a text and a button. And we actually have a variant to be able to tilt that image because we just think it looks better. Um, and then going further down, we incorporate what we call a card grid. And we have different kinds of card grids. We have a single card grid, a double, and here a triple. And then this is also a card grid for four. I think it's, well, one is called features and I, I, they have different nomenclatures, but it's, we have a four as well. And all of this is responsive um, and how they're shaped and yeah, show the responsiveness, which is nice. So it looks equally as nice on a cell phone or on a tablet. Um, we can have headlines and a photo or headlines, a blurb and a photo you know, we can kind of mix and match those combinations to create the look we want. Um, one of the the kinds of paragraphs we also have is like a call to action, which is, you know, text and a button or text and a picture and a button. So having these elements allowed us to take, we don't have that many template types, but it, it allowed us to, to really give the website some cohesion as far as look and feel, but the, the, at the same time, a lot of flexibility in the internal pages to for, to meet the needs of the content. So that's about all I have to say about paragraphs. Lenny, do you want to do the SSO talk? You're going to have to unmute. You are muted. Yeah, I can't hear you, Donnie. Yeah, he doesn't say he's muted, but uh, he's probably logging mm -hmm. off and coming back in. So. Does that hear me now? Yeah, Why? now you're good. Okay, good. So anyway, needless to say, this was a big project and, and it went really well. Um, and, you know, the initial site that we launched in 2010 
uh, which is when I started at the union, uh, went really well and it served us well and it, it got, you know, our feet wet in terms of a, a major enterprise content management system. Um, but when we first launched um, Pressflow and in, in great, you know, ingested all of the content that we had from our very old antiquated content management system. We also had to take into consideration that we have a lot of uh, web-based applications that our members use. They use it to access their benefits. They use it to change their address, their mailing address, things that are, are uh, relatively secure uh, or very secure actually. And initially when we worked with our last third party vendor, we kind of kludged the Drupal login uh, to work with our applications. So people would log into our Drupal site and then we would take them over to the applications, which was a little bit difficult. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about our decision to use uh, a single sign on and why we, we went um, in the direction that we did. Um, um, we needed to have uh, an instance of uh, single sign-on capability so that people could just log in once and go to our applications. Uh, which are not in Drupal. Yeah, which are not in Drupal. These are Java, web-based Java applications. And, and we had a lot of uh, things to consider as people were going into the uh, website because we wanted to make sure that we could use it uh, in a federated way so that people could get to our different applications. So even after hiring a Gartner group and consulting with them on some of the solutions that other large enterprise uh, organizations were using for their SSO, um, they had many suggestions, but we needed a better way. And we wanted to do something because we were not for profit organization. We wanted to do something open source that we could control in house. So we met with a lot of vendors and different, there's a lot of people providing very large scale identity management solutions. Um, but they tend to get very expensive because not only do you have to do the development, which has a very uh, considerable upfront cost, but then thereafter you have a constant subscription cost. So um, what we decided to do since we manage our systems in um, Linux is we decided to use Red Hat's single sign-on open source uh, package called Keycloak. So it took us a couple of years to develop this and because we didn't really have a lot of experience in that realm. So um, we set about making something that was easy to use and that was flexible um, and that was Keycloak. And so now when people log in or sign up for our website, um, they're able to authenticate validate their email the same way that they do if it was a Drupal product, and then further get into our systems like uh, email subscriptions or uh, primarily the web Java web-based applications that we built also in-house. The mobile app uh, as well? Well, yeah, they have to sign up. We have a mobile app that was designed uh, also by a third-party vendor. Um, but people need to sign up on the web and be authenticated there in order to get to it. Um, so, you know, it was pretty a pretty big deal and we're happy with the way it works now. And we're also in the process of integrating that single sign-on system with uh, Salesforce. Um, so it's very seamless. Once you log into Drupal, you can get into protected content areas because not everybody who comes to our site can see everything that's on our site. Um, you know, only members can see certain areas, only chapter leaders can see certain areas. So that's why we have to have, you know, secure login. But we also have, you know, various tokens for the content contributors, just like as if you would 
on any uh, Drupal system. Um, but initially when we did it the first time around, it was a bear to try to integrate any kind of single sign-on with Drupal. Um, but uh, um, Four Kitchens, almost said Avomatic, Four Kitchens helped us do it this time. <laughs> and we were very successful and people just seamlessly go to our website, go to log in or sign up and you know, then they can authenticate and get to our application. So I did want to talk a little bit about that in case, you know, anybody is experienced, anybody who does host web applications uh, was interested about the single sign-on process. And that's all I have. I don't know if anybody has any questions for me or regarding single sign-on or our development. Um, you know, I think one of the next steps is going to see be how we can integrate parts of Drupal with Salesforce if and when necessary, um, and how people will, you know, our members will navigate between maybe certain content that's hosted in Salesforce and certain content that, that's hosted in Drupal. But uh, it is definitely a team effort. We work, you know, cross-functionally with the digital communications team, graphics, and as well as our third party vendors. And and Matthew and Robin and John Bly, who is here somewhere, are all uh, integral uh, members of the team. Uh, to piggyback on what you were saying about SSO and what another person asked about the roadmap is, so I had mentioned this Janice case and how we wanted to serve our members better. So we we try we set up Salesforce to capture information about them so that we could serve them better and understand them better. Like what what do they really do? Are they clicking on emails? Are they going, you know, what are their behaviors so that we can really just service them um, and not just guess what they want and. So this SSO integration is, you know, so some of that is future proofing of like, to how can they have a seamless experience through all of our products, no matter what they're logging in, whether it's their, you know, welfare fund benefits, which is basically health benefits, or whether they're trying to find out information about their contracts or their grievances. We wanted them to have a seamless experience, but obviously Drupal cannot host all of these different kinds of things. But, you know, from the user standpoint, you know, they don't care that they've just went from one system to the next. They, so we're really trying hard to figure out how to do that. Um, so like what Nani mentioned about Salesforce is, you know, the Salesforce is bringing in all this personalized information about the member. And that could be very handy. It could be, you know, oh, the last time you got your optical certificate to get glasses was a year ago. So you're not eligible yet or now you are eligible, here's your certificate so that you can print it out and bring it to your optometrist. Um, you know, so we're, so we're, or if they have certain kinds of certifications that they need to keep their licenses, you know, we probably, I don't think we have it yet, but I think we're building out stuff to be able to let them know, yeah, we know you have this many credits, you're good. You know, you don't need to do anything on your license. So a lot of that is our roadmap, but it's not directly in Drupal. It's sort of in the, what Lenny used the phrase federated, um, our federation of systems all, you know, we're trying to just keep them all integrated and have them talk to each other and understand all of that data. I'm um, working concert with each other. That's what I got. And just on a quick side note, since we're wrapping up. Uh, I really want to thank you. Go ahead. Just on a. Sorry, go on, Matthew. No, go ahead. I'm. I'm just going to say on a quick side note. Um, I don't know if everybody else has experienced this, but you know we've been working remotely. A lot of you may work remotely all the time, but we just started working remotely in March, about mid late March, and uh, I don't know about you guys, but we've been tremendously busy ever since then. Really, uh, doing a lot of work nonstop, even more. It seems like we've been more busy than when we were in the office. Um, and with that said, you yeah. know, with the, the rates ticking up here in New York, you know, I'm sure people with kids are concerned about what's happening with the schools. Um, so in addition to the city websites, um, you can go to uft.org and follow up on what might be going on uh, in the school system or particularly for teachers. 
we have a whole parent portal too, like not just for teachers, but one for parents. Yeah, it, sound, it looks like NYPL has been pretty busy as well. Yeah, actually, yeah. March and April were, were insane. Yeah, Salim, that's a really interesting question. I mean, I think there's always uh, concern about uh, personal information leaking from Salesforce. Um, you know, they've been really uh, on top of trying to secure that information um, because we were ve we're very careful with uh, our members' data. We don't put any really highly sensitive information sensitive. in there. Um, we've got that locked down to our uh, Java-based, very highly secure uh, web applications. But yes, yeah, so that's always a concern. Yeah, HIPAA that's is a right. big deal for us. Like, no, I can't even get birthdays from the welfare funds. <laughs> you know, like so, and birthdays are not that sensitive. So, thank you, Matthew, You're Lenny, welcome. and Robin. The migration itself took a couple of months because of the because of taxonomy. We couldn't get the taxonomy right. It, the mapping kept, you know, we had to try it over and over. But once we, you know, worked out the kinks, it was quick. But then, actually, funny, haha, -ha, like not so funny was we were able to migrate all the data to Drupal, but it wasn't mapped on the menus. So we had to hire somebody who's now on this call, John, to map it. On, and put it on menus. That was a huge task of 10,000 nodes to be put on menus. That's incredible. Any other questions for our, our, our panel? Oh, everyone, thank you. Matthew, Lenny, and Robin for taking your time out of your busy day. Thank you, Scott. Um, you, you guys probably know more. Thank you, Robin. Uh, you probably know more about the... Um, the the rates of Corona going up. Don't believe what they're saying. I had, I had a friend of mine call me today. The rates are going up much higher than they're saying. So be careful out there over the next couple of months. Um, thanks. We'll have some closing remarks at five and an after party on Zoom. Free, free beer as long as you have it in your house. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, for whatever you want to drink, it's up to you. I really thank everyone for coming in. We've been working it. We work. I'm glad it, it it's done as well as it as it has for the most, many people. And you know, it's work on Drupal. And if you can give back to the Drupal community, tomorrow's contribution day. We need help with documentation. We need help with with um, bug fixing. And remember, almost everyone in this call in this thing owes there are earnings somewhat to Drupal. So what you can to give back, give back. It's helpful. I mean, big corporations give money. If you put a little time in, even if you do one documentation, it's helpful. We need it. And th thank you and everyone have a safe weekend. The rain finally has stopped, I think, for a little while, for a few minutes. Okay, well, thank you again. Scott, thank you, Robin, for bringing us in for this. Thank you, Lenny, for your part. And thank you, the audience, for listening to us and not stoning us. <laughs> that would be kind of hard virtually. <laughs> but I'm intrigued to find how they do it. Thanks, John. Coming, John, to come lately. No, he was no, he was here <laughs> in his defense. Yeah, he was I, here. You no, might I saw not him at the beginning. Him. I mean, I think he's been in and out. And thanks for having us, Scott. I just make fun of him. Bye. I just make fun of him. You got it. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Have a good day. Bye-bye.